here uh, today to have an opportunity to hear uh, David Prater talk about his his work. I'd just like to say, uh, first of all, that um, the fact that David is here is enabled by um, two uh, um, grant-funded opportunities we have, one of which is the Artline project and the other of which is the uh, ElmSIP project. So I'd just say a, a quick word about Artline. I know some of you already know about the Artline project, but in particular, uh, the researchers here at BTH are involved in not only a, a sort of a digital storytelling uh, series, wherein we're uh, collecting stories from sea travelers um, who uh, move uh, within the, the southern Baltic region, and um, then we'll ultimately take the stories that we collect and they'll get transformed into art pieces that get exhibited uh, around the Baltic region. But we're also involved in a secondary um, project, which is called the Digital Art Platform Initiative. And in the Digital Art Platform Initiative, we're really researching and thinking about the ways in which uh, contemporary digital art practices um, and all kinds of arts, that means performing arts or literary arts and um, other uh, representations of the arts, can be impacted through the influence of digital media and, uh, and then to consider the ways in which um, practices such as publishing, for example, may be influenced or shifted or changed by digital media practices, or in which we can just consider what does it, you know, what does it mean to publish in a contemporary digital age and to what extent uh, are those material practices changed or, or altered because of that. So David's talk is um, specifically uh, one, the, the first in a sort of series of explorations of thinking about our arts practices within a contemporary digital environment. Um, and as he has said uh, explicitly, although his work doesn't directly address uh, digital transformations uh, and, and the mediations, that uh, his dissertation didn't directly do that. The work in which he's involved now within the ElmSIP project really do reflect that. So ElmSIP, the other uh, EU-funded project which brought David to us here as a postdoctoral research for a year, is the, let me see if I can remember ElmSIP, ele electronic literature as a model of creative. Or, or of creativity. Oh, is it of? Um, <laughs> <laughs> okay, so that's about, about not knowing uh, what, what else Whoa, is it, it, who it, am it I? Explores, um, <laughs> it explores the idea, again, of uh, electronic literature and um, pedagogical practice in particular. So David is here as a postdoctoral research working in that um, in that form, so that's why he's attached to us for, uh, attached to us, that sounds rather well, for, uh, for a year here. Um, and we're really excited, though, to have him get the opportunity to talk more about his research and background and his work uh, as a poet and researcher as well. So uh, David got his Bachelor of Arts from the University of Sydney. He has an MA from um, the University of Melbourne in Australia, of course. Um, a PhD from the Swinburne University of Technology, and as I mentioned, that he, his dissertation work is the basis for his talk here today, uh, issues of publishing and self-publishing within poetry. Um, he's published in a number of international journals himself, participated in a number of international festivals, uh, is well known as a um, poet in the international uh, community. He is also works as a teacher and as a researcher. He um, has been the managing editor of Cordite Poetry Review, which is an online Australian poetry um, journal. Uh, and I think he might talk a, a little bit about that today. <laughs> well, you can ask him about that afterwards, because it's a very interesting group. And so again, it's a very um, knowledgeable about poetry, publishing, and, and, and the issues that he's going to talk about today. So let's welcome David, and he can tell us more about his work. Thank you. Um, thank you for that uh, introduction, Lisa. I, I hope you don't mind if I sit down. Is that all right? Because you're all sitting down, and uh, <laughs> I, d I don't want to feel left out. And but I, but I'm, I'm going to be um, speaking from some prepared notes. I have some slides with some uh, kind of cool images on them as well, and I'm going to read out some poems. So when I read out the poems, I will stand up, and then you'll really feel like I'm performing performing for you today. Um, so I'll, I'll start off by reading from, from a text that I've prepared. And when I get bored of that, and perhaps when you get bored of that, you just put up your hands and say, don't do that anymore. You know, just talk to us. Um, I'll do that. But over the past few days, I've been thinking about 
Um, oh, so this is me, yeah. Um, I've been thinking about the best way to introduce myself to you because I, I, a lot of you I don't know you and you don't know me. And at first I thought that I could start off by introducing a series of anecdotes about my life in the style of an old school professor. And if I were to make such an introduction in front of a group of students and staff from a program in digital culture, I'd probably begin by recalling the first time I ever used a computer, which was the Commodore 64 in 1980 at the age of eight. I'd then go on to recall my experience of watching Return of the Jedi at roughly the same age on pirated, I think, beta video. I'd maybe even throw in a couple of references to other old school technologies, like the fact that I lived in a small country town, which was the last place in Australia to be hooked up to a manual telephone exchange, complete with an operator who knew where everyone was at any given time of the day. I'd then go on to describe fondly my memory of the first time I ever saw an automatic teller machine. My father having worked as a bank manager, I'd then mention the fact that all of the computers used in the bank were supplied by the Burroughs Company, one of whose uh, relatives was the writer and uh, notorious drug addict William S. Burroughs. <laughs> I'd then try and make some connection between all of these things and the fact that I typed up my first story on a computer at the age of 10 and have been using computers in one way or, or another ever since. And, but then I'd conclude my opening remarks by saying that despite all of the changes that have occurred over at least the last 20 years in the way we use technology to make creative works, so stories, poetry, music, motion pictures, photography, lolcats, I still believe in the magical power of the printed word and the symbolic power of books. And then I'd sign off with this absolutely incredible quote from the writer Flann O'Brien in which he says that a better, f a better case for the banning of all poetry is the simple fact that most of it is bad. Uh, and then he goes on and on and on. And then he says at the end, moreover, poets are usually unpleasant people who are poor and who insist forever on discussing that incredibly boring subject, books. <laughs> but in the end I decided not to go with such an introduction and so instead we'll start here. <laughs> In 1983, the American Library Association produced a po poster featuring the character of Yoda from George Lucas' Star Wars trilogy. In the poster, which bore the title Read and the Force is with you, the Jedi Master Yoda carried his trademark cane as well as a red hardbound book. It's uncanny, isn't it? <laughs> The book bears no title, but might be a diary or a notebook, or else an anonymously published novel. Those slightly incongruous, those familiar claws clutching the little red book to its chest, the plastic eyes looking straight at those of the viewer or reader, it could even be read as a representation of Yoda, the self-publishing author. A novelist, perhaps, posing as if about to hand over his collected works, Juvenilia, a Western, a war novel, or else, yes, a slim volume of verse. In fact, Yoda's de debut collection, of which only several hundred were printed in a small 24-hour print shop somewhere in the mists of the Dagobah system. While information on this poster, which was produced as part of an annual reading and literacy campaign, is scant, and my discovery of it was accidental, its existence is nevertheless important to my presentation which seeks to describe the world of self-publishing, a world in which self-publishing authors, be they poets, biographers, historians, fiction or travel guide writers, produce and disseminate artistic works independently of, or even at odds with, other sections of the book publishing industry. And further, while introducing this poster may seem spurious or slightly ridiculous, and of course it is, it is also relevant as a symbol of what is routinely left out of cultural analysis. That is, the liminal or the marginal. Uh, in other words, rubbish. This is not to argue that self-published books are rubbish, although many of them are, or conversely that they are superior to other kinds of books. 
But the fact remains that my thesis was concerned with a variety of publishing actors and activities, including self-publishing, vanity publishing, subsidy publishing, private publishing, and so on. These terms are used equally in the negative and positive sense in writings on the subject of publishing. And just like the imaginary geography of Star Wars, this world of self-publishing, this Yoda land, perhaps, is a vast landscape or field dotted with an array of writers and creators producing self-published books. A fuller understanding of this field depends on information found in informal or unofficial sources from lesser known writings and unpublished materials. But Yodaland is also a world in which a poet such as Walt Whitman, whose book Leaves of Grass was originally self-published, could go on to write favourable reviews of his book under fictitious names in order to promote its sale, and then quote from these reviews in future editions of the book. This actually happened. So in, in some ways Walt Whitman is a fraud. It's, Yodeland is a strange and puzzling world in which, and here's Leaves of Grass on the left, Walt Whitman, um, in which Coleridge and Wordsworth, the famous romantic poets, could publish the first edition of their book of poetry, Lyrical Ballads, anonymously and through a third party. Um, it's a shameful world in which one learns that the career of Patrick White, um, who is uh, Australia's only Nobel Prize winning novelist, was kick-started by his own mother, who paid for the publication of his first book of poems, The Ploughman. And it's interesting to reflect on the reasons why Patrick White would spend the rest of his life trying to find and destroy every last copy of this seemingly harmless little book. And there you are. Isn't it a cute little book? So my thesis uh, basically talked about these kinds of famous uh, instances um, as a way of kind of questioning um, um, uh, accepted accepted ideas of who is good and who is not good. We often think of Walt Whitman as, a, as someone who's in the canon, but he started out as someone outside the literary mainstream and actually had to, um, was reduced to basically falsifying his own fame to become famous. And then he became very famous, etc. Um, Yoda Land is also a space of unpublished works. Uh, for example, an author such as Emily Dickinson, who basically only published 12 poems or a, a dozen poems in her lifetime. Most of her poetry was then uh, destroyed upon her death, uh, according to her wishes, but a lot of it was saved. And this is an example of her original manuscript, and then it was uh, printed up and made, made proper, made, uh, made correct after her death. Um, so I guess what I'm trying to say is that um, Yoda land or whatever we want to call this place it's a kind of anti-world whose borders are actually visible and quantifiable and if it were a kind of narrative that you would read in Chaucer who is uh, uh, of course uh, another very old fashioned well obviously very old fashioned <laughs> very old dude if he was still alive today um, if, if this Yodaland was a kind of Chaucerian narrative or a pack of tarot cards, its characters might include the mainstream publisher, the subsidised publisher, the independent publisher, the small press, the academic publisher, the journal publisher, the clandestine press, the self-publisher, the vanity publisher, the performance publisher, the co-publishers, the new media publisher, the private press, and saddest of all, the private poet. This last figure probably accurately describes the kind of poet I was when I wrote the following lines sometime around the turn of the 21st century. Uh, I don't know if you can actually read that, but it starts off by saying, So far I'm my only reader, but I like what I see. Writing becomes much easier when you can focus on present company, though it be for poor, etc, etc, etc. It's feeling very sorry for myself at that time because no one wanted to read my works and I wasn't a famous author like Walt Whitman and I didn't have the courage to produce books that said I was a legend. <laughs> of course I've cheered up somewhat over the last decade or so but there is still a part of me that will always remain the private poet or was that a private dancer? 
I'm your private poet, a poet for money, performing my poems for you. <laughs> yes, I'm a private poet, a poet for money, and any old rhyme scheme will do. But enough about me and Tina Turner. When I began researching self-publishing in Australian poetry, I envisaged a grand sociological study in the style of French theorist Pierre Bourdieu and his uh, classic study, Distinction. Um, in hindsight, it's easy to, for me to scorn my optimism that I could summarise an entire field of self-publishing in a manner such as this. Um, at the time, I guess, I was wanting to write a, a, a kind of more scientific thesis. This is not me, by the way. This is Pierre Bourdieu. Um, um, as a response to the fact that so many people around me were um, doing um, writing theses that were creative instead of sociological or critical. And it seemed that a lot of people were getting away with uh, becoming a PhD uh, just by writing a few poems or writing a novel. Of course, I did the same thing myself when I wrote um, my MA, which was a, a, a fictional story about marzipan. Don't want to talk about that. Um, but at the same time, it was very difficult for me because I, at, uh, at the same time as I started writing my thesis, I received a grant from the Australia Council, which is our, our major arts funding body in Australia. And the poems that I produced with the support of this grant later appeared in We Will Disappear, uh, which was my first full-length um, book of poetry. And I have a cop copy of it here. Um, so my PhD thesis would not exist in its final form if We Will Disappear had not been published. And it's very fortunate because the existence of this book made it possible for me to start talking about other books that I had produced, sometimes in secret, for the last seven or eight years before that. And here's a few examples of them. The first one there, you can't really see it very well, but it's the first book I ever um, made myself. I'll pass these around in a moment. Um, this for me is like my, my the plowman or my leaves of grass. I made it myself. Uh, I'm very proud of it. It means a lot to me. I only have two copies of it left, so please don't think you can steal one and <laughs> take it with you. I'll be searching your bags on the way out. Um, and the second one, um, it's a bit hard to see, but it, it was a, uh, it's called Eight Poems, and funnily enough, it contains eight poems. Um, the next one was a, um, a, a very small pamphlet that I made with a friend. Um, doesn't even have any staples in it. Um, it's it's a kind of very kind of I guess obscure piece of piece of uh, writing. And then I've made three more um, in in the intervening time. Um, Arben Land is a book of travel poems. Dead Poem Office. We'll talk about that a little bit later. And another chapbook, Morgan Land, which was actually produced by a, a, what you might call a proper um, publisher. Um, and the thing that I found when I was uh, writing my thesis was that I started to think of all of these, uh, these six chapbooks as kinds of performances. And what I mean by that is that it became possible, and this is what I did in my thesis, to carry out a reading of the production, circulation and reception of these books, even though none of them, most of them were not actually seen or read by anybody. Um, in terms of uh, how they were performed, so not not um, my thesis in, ended up being about these books, but not about the contents of the books. Um, there's nothing worse, I find, than a writer going on forever about what their poems mean and what they meant when they were writing these these poems. What I find is more interesting is that uh, is to find out how the po how the poet went about making that book, um, what sort of rules or laws they might have broken in order to make that book, and that was certainly the case with a couple of. Uh, the books that that I that, that I produced. Um, okay, so uh, I'll be getting on to um, a few a, a, a discussion of some of these books. But what I might do now is just pass some of these around. <laughs> Take one, pass it on.
that will give uh, some of you something to do while, while your eyes glaze over at this next section, which is uh, my compulsory theory slide. Um, and of course, it's a bit of theory um, written by Pierre Bourdieu. Although the break between poetry and the mass readership has been virtually total since the late 19th century, it is one of the sectors in which there are still many books published at the author's expense. Poetry continues to represent the ideal model of literature for the least cultured consumers. Um, this quote captures for me many of the tensions that are played out in the act or performance of book publishing. There's the field of poetry publishing, where poetry books are published at the author's own expense, enclosed by the dominant field of commercial publishing and mass readership. And within this field, excuse me, poetry maintains its status as proper literature thus perpetuating a certain style of proper poetry book publication. Now, I don't know what you guys think, but my reaction as a writer and as a poet, when people say to me, oh, you know, what do you do? And I say, oh, I'm a poet, and they go, oh, wow. You know, or they just kind of walk away. You know, they say, I've got to take a phone call. Um, and the, these people don't read poetry. Actually, most people don't, and that's what I think uh, Bourdieu is getting at here that actually most people do not read poetry. In Australia the average print run for a book of poetry is 500 copies and that's certainly the case with this one and I think we've probably sold about 50 of them in four or five years. So the reasons why people become poets and write poetry are not to do with money although you know I obviously look very famous and wealthy um, but you know that's just, a, that's just my style, that's how I roll. Um, so people get into this, into this field of publishing for other reasons. And as Pierre Bourdieu uh, discusses at length in his, in, his, uh, in his work, it's because of the kind of symbolic capital that poets and poetry books possess. Um, and this is, what I, this is what I was getting at when I, when I say to people, oh, I'm a poet, I write, I write poetry books. They go, wow, that's, that's really impressive, man. It's so great that you're doing something creative with your life. And then you say, well, would you like to buy a copy? <laughs> They're like, no, no, I'll take one for free. You know, that would be nice. And, and in the end, that's what I've had, had to do, is that I've had to give away most of my books uh, for free. So to perpetuate this idea that I'm a, I'm a romantic poet, you know. Um, okay, so that's the bit of theory. In, and I want to just quickly go through this um, this next bit because I'm already way behind time. But um, in my thesis, I make uh, a lot of uh, a lot of the dif difference between various definitions. The two I want to talk about here. We all we all know what proper publishing is, don't we? <laughs> it's proper. You know, it's like correct. It's like the real publishing, you know, it's like ISBNs, you know, sold in a bookshop, gigantic author photo on the back. <laughs> the, uh, the ones I'm most interested in are self-publishing and vanity publishing. And of course, this is where the title of my presentation comes from. Um, and in the literature, a lot, a lot, of, uh, a lot of writers think of self-publishing and vanity publishing as exactly the same thing. And you might actually agree with that. You might think, yeah, well, a self-publisher, they're, they're obviously pretty vain, you know, like someone like Walt Whitman. He was a very vain man. Um, but for me, there's a big difference. A self-publisher pays for and organises and produces their own works and presents themselves as a self-publishing author. I published this. You know, I made this book. This is for you from me. A vanity publisher or someone who has their works published through a vanity publisher, uh, it's a kind of disguise. They might make up a name for the publishing company. Um, they might um, pay a lot of money to produce a very nice looking book that no one has edited. Um, so there's a big difference for me between those two things. But, you know, there, there, are, there are very many ways in which um, the, the definitions overlap. And of course, then there's then there's private publishing, which I mean, of course, I wouldn't expect you to know about it because it's private. You know, it's you're never going to hear about this stuff. Um, but I like it, and it's good. Um, so before we get on to um, discussing some of these books, and and I'll read some poems from these books for you, uh, I just want to talk to you for a moment about chapbooks. Now, does anyone know what a chapbook is? Sorry? 
Well, you're just passing around. So you think that are they chapbooks? Okay. <laughs> All right. So, what is a chapbook? <laughs> um, so this is a very old-fashioned term. This is like a term that comes from you know, six, the 1600s. This 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 definition of a chapbook was written, or a person who distributes chapbooks was written 400 years ago. Um, now, according to um, the first definition, there, they were usually about six inches by four inches, so about sort of this big. Yeah, in the in the olden days, um, they had illustrations in them, and they were very short. You know, maybe up to 20, 24 pages, and they were carried around by these people who were called peddlers or chapmen. Interesting, huh? And there was someone who, if you can just you know visualize this, they had a long kind of pack that they hung around their necks, and they put in this pack almanacs, books of news, or other trifling wares. Now, I think that's a really kind of key thing, that they talk about trifling wares. These are kind of the things that you, they, they don't actually have much value, and that they're probably not trying to sell them for very much either. But that's, what, that's, that's where this idea of this kind of book, which I think, as, as you say, is also actually a chat book, that's where it comes from. And this is a picture of what one looked like. Um, and I like this one because it's about industry and sloth, and then you know sloth is one of my favourite things. Um, and there's a, an actually a picture of it, not a chap man, but a chap boy. Um, okay, so the chapbook tradition has been um, um, preserved by zine and avant-garde literary movements. Now you all know what zines are, I hope. Okay, can I get a show of hands? Does anyone know what a zine is? Be honest. Like a fanzine, yeah. So, anyone else? No one else knows what that is. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Maybe I'll just, you know, move in a very different world. Um, in any case, the, the kind of point that I'm trying to make is that the books that poets make today come from a very, very long tradition. And it's also perhaps a little bit coincidental, and I was thinking about this the other day, that th this is basically the size of an iPad, yeah? About the same size. Anyway, so you, we could talk maybe a little bit more at the end about, about maybe modern day equivalents of chapbooks and maybe how the, f the, the, the format and the size has actually been reproduced in, in uh, more digital technologies. Anyway, uh, enough about that. I want to talk to you very briefly about my first chapbook, The Happy Farang, as I, as I described to you before. Um, do I s where, where, where is that? <laughs> Has anyone got it? Someone's already stolen it. Oh, you've got it. Okay. It's up there. Can you just hold it up so that everyone knows what the... <laughs> Hiya. That's it. Great. Okay. Um, so, The Happy Farang. Uh, is a 26-page chapbook. Um, the poems that were published in this book, I wrote them when I was uh, traveling in Thailand uh, in 1999. And most of them are written from the point of view of a Western tourist, and that's where the title comes from. In Thai, a, a farang is like a Western tourist. And I was a happy farang at that time. I was very happy. As you can see by my very moody author shot. I actually made a different version of this with a sort of stenciled on hat and some stitches on the face and stuff, but I don't know what happened to that. Um, sorry? <laughs> um, so this, this is a book of poems that I wrote, you know, a very, very long time ago. I actually, um, uh, I printed out one copy of the book for myself. Um, and in 2000, I took this book with me to a friend's house in another city in Australia. And he had access to a colour photocopier at his work. So one night around 10 o'clock, we, and, and I won't say the place where he worked because there may be people in the audience who, who may be able to, you know, get back to the person whose work it was. Uh, it was a member of parliament anyway. Um, um, so we went, we went down to the, to the parliamentary office and we uh, got, a, got the, the colour photocopier cranked up 
and we made uh, 200 copies of the book. It took us hours. I mean, we had to do each page, you know, 200 times, and then put them all together and staple them, but we did it. And that book that you have floating around there somewhere, so that's actually, you know, a kind of stolen, uh, illegal book. It was made illegally. So don't, you know, don't try to hang on to it too much. Um, what else can I say about this book? Oh, yeah, that, so that's what the poems looked like when they were written before they, before they went into the book. Um, so one thing that I want you to sort of have a look at here is what, what do you notice about this, this page? Blue, well done. <laughs> Anything else? <laughs> Price, tag. Price tag. Yeah. So this is the this for me is the very kind of cool thing that it's now it was actually sold and it was available for sale in a bookshop for a very short period of time, but no one bought it, so I had to take it back. Uh, but uh, when it came back to me, it, it had the price tag still on it. That's kind of cool. Um, because in many respects, the book itself is a kind of anti-capitalist statement. There's no ISBN. Um, there's no kind of um, um, uh, type of typography and layout that you would find in, in normal um, books. There's actually, um, I, in, in the book, I listed the publisher as Pumpkin Press. And that press doesn't exist, obviously. So in many ways, you could say it's actually uh, it's vanity publishing. I'm disguising the fact that I made this myself. But of course, it, actually, I think it's really self-publishing because uh, no vanity publisher, hopefully, would make anything quite as, as amateur and, and kind of, I don't know, zany as that. Um, all right, so what I'm going to do now is I'm, I'm, instead of just talking about these, these books forever, I'm just going to read some poems. Is that all right? Yeah? Does it, where is the book? Because I need to. So I'll read. I'll read out the um, the title poem, which is called "The Happy Foreign." Hello. I am so happy to be a Farang in your country, relieved to discover this word that describes me, and pleased to be here spending all my money on trinkets and going to the toilet. Hooray! Now even my shit is Farang, a foreign body yearning to be assimilated. Get out of Thailand, I say to my ungrateful excrement. Leave more room for KFC and Coke. I look forward also to depositing another 500 baht at the airport, also for Rang, and can't wait to develop all of my excellent photos. Bye for now. And this is uh, kind of continuing, in continuing the theme of tourism. It's called non-touristic trek. Come and see the hill tribes plowing up their opium fields in preparation for next year's crop of Nescafe. This trek, this non-touristic trek, has been approved by both the Thai and US governments. Along with joint military exercises, it will constitute the main thrust of their war against drugs. No rafting, elephant, hiking, or souvenir shopping experience required. Just a willingness to accept this once in a lifetime opportunity to join a non-touristic trek. I repeat, there will be one trek only. Afterwards, the entire region will be declared frequented by tourists and closed to all non-touristic activities, thus causing a massive rise in both prices and tourist numbers. Hurry, this is your last chance to see untouched and authentic hill tribes in their natural environment. Repeat, one trek only. Inquire within. Credit cards welcome. Um, do you want to hear one more? Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Um, 
Do you want to hear one about tourism? <laughs> <laughs> Something different. Um, they're all about tourists, actually. It's been so long since I read this, uh, had a look through this book. It's kind of very strange. I get a bit emotional. Um, I don't know what. I don't, sorry, I, I don't know what to uh, what to read. I'll read this one. that's called um, "A Photographer's Wet Dream." Ah, and this is about. It's actually about Laos, not Thailand. Ah, Luang Prabang, ancient capital, UNESCO World Heritage, magnificently preserved in pristine condition. Please bring cameras, film, and Kleenex for the mop up. Click, and we're off through the viewfinder. Monks, kiddies, grannies, trannies, right for developing when you get back to your secret laboratory. National Geographic are definitely interested. Oh, I'm spent, I'm spent again. How the stock churns like spectators through a turnstile. I can feel it, the money shots in my sights. I'm getting warmer now, I can't hold off much. Oh, click, click, Jesus, click, oh. Another Kleenex moment. <laughs> So you can probably understand why I didn't really want this book of poems to be known to the whole world. Um, in some ways it's, um, oh there you go, I was going to say that. Anyway, I didn't read the Tintin one, doesn't matter. Um, so in some ways I was very happy uh, uh, to kind of keep this book to myself and not let too many other people know about it. Uh, if we fast forward seven years to the publication of this book, uh, we will disappear. Um, and the reason I, I'm choosing to talk about this book is that, you know, the contrast between them could not be greater. Uh, this is an 84 page book, it's got a spine, there were 500 printed, there's an ISBN on the back of the book, it's got like, it's got these little flaps, <laughs> really cool. I loved it anyway at the time, uh, not many people have read it. Um, so. In some ways, this, this book was a kind of summary of, of a lot of poems that I've, I've written over about 10 years. It was very um, inspired by the band Sonic Youth, uh, especially uh, their album Daydream Nation and the song Disappearer. Um, it also contained a poem that was originally published on a CD-ROM, but which then made it into the best Australian poetry. And is, I think the first... Um, digital poem that ever made it into one of those anthologies. And I just want to give myself little props for the little arrow there. In the middle it took ages. Um, now the reason why I want to compare um, these two books is, that I don't know if you can see this very well, can you see how many times my name is mentioned on the cover of this book? Can you count them up? Can you see? A, you can't see. <laughs> so it says there, uh, photographed by David Prater. David Prater. David Prater. David Prater. David Prater. There's six. Actually, there's another one of it. I, it's, it's an earlier version of the book, so it doesn't have it there. So this book cover mentions my name seven times. And yet this book that only mentions my name once is thought of as self-publishing or vanity publishing. Don't you think it's a little bit ridiculous? Not only is my name mentioned seven times, but you've got this horrible, gigantic picture of me on the back of it as well, which I didn't want to be that big. Um, so in some ways, uh, it, it's kind of weird to think of this as the proper poetry book, because in a way, this is more sort of a fantasy of who I am than, than this book. I think this book's actually quite humble. Um, the cover image, I took that myself, you know, tick that off. Um, it's got a testimonial. You know, it's saying how wonderful I am. I didn't write this one, unlike Walt Whitman, who wrote all of his himself. The author shot, my God, it's gigantic. I actually prefer this one. 
Can you see that? Um, in any case, I, I won't go on too much more about that. The, the, this book was launched at the Melbourne Writers' Festival, and I wrote on my blog a description of what happened afterwards, and I'll just read it out for you now. Well, the truth is that I've been in and out of rehab since my book launch at the Melbourne Writers' Festival almost three weeks ago. That's what happens when you choose to drink a glass of champagne for each, gla for each page of your book. And even with a slim volume of verse, that's 84 champagnes for me. After the launch, it was straight outside to begin downing those 84 champagnes. The empty empties piled up and friends began to peel off, summoned to other duties, other champagne drinking contests. As the sun began to fade, I realised that it would soon be over and that a chance like this comes only a very few times in anyone's life. I switched to schooners and then pints of champagne until the festival bar announced that they had sold out of copies of my book, now called We Will Champagne. After a couple of fascinating conversations with several slightly moist champagne glasses, my champagnes dragged me away to the champagne bar where we champagned until the early champagnes of the champagne. It was around this time that I lost track of the number of champagnes that I had drunk in my champagnes and I decided to call it quits, surmising that I had probably passed my 84 glass tar target with a couple of flutes to spare. Um, and here's a picture of the uh, event, you can't see it very well, but it proves that people were there. Um, now this book uh, was, uh, pub was reviewed uh, in three separate um, um, venues. The first one was on ABC Radio, there's a national radio in Australia. The second one was in uh, The Weekend Australian, which is a national newspaper. And the third one is, uh, was on this website, Cordite, which, uh, as Lisa already told you, I am the editor of. It's not a very good look, is it, to have your own book reviewed, and very positively, I might add, in the pages of your own journal. Now, I've been here, sitting here slagging off Walt Whitman and saying what a fraud he was. Don't you think I'm a little bit of a fraud too? Yeah. Hands up who thinks I'm a fraud. <laughs> right, see there's six, half a dozen people who, who will not be speaking to me after this. But, <laughs> but it does, and, and of course I didn't commission this review. I don't know the author, you know, it, well, it had nothing to do with me, except for the fact that I'm the person who produces the website, so I had to sort of, you know, put the image there and make sure all the little block quotes turn out properly. So, in a way, it is kind of dodgy. Do you have this expression? Do you say this? Dodgy? We say that in Australia, dodgy, you know, fraud. Fraud. Um, <clears throat> so, just, I, I guess that's, that's all I want to say about, about this book. And, um, but I will read a couple of poems from, from the book for you. Um, and I'm not going to read the ones that I said I was going to read, actually. Um, as you can tell, I'm sort of uh, a, a person who, in my poetry, I like to swear a bit, and I like to talk about you know things and issues that I wouldn't normally do in a, in a conversation with someone on the street. Um, so this this poem is actually um, was uh, produced using the Google search engine, and by typing in the words "Google fucking" into Google, and. This is what I came up with, actually. I didn't write any of this. This is actual real stuff. Oh, I'm not sure it was such a good idea. To <laughs> <laughs> Would you like to hear the poem? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck yeah. yeah. Fuck yeah. <laughs> OK. Search only in fucking. Viewing in Google page rank order. View in alphabetical order Toto reviews. More interesting than the phone book. Comment four. Google fucking sucks. Thanks to whoever hit this site after plugging Google fucking sucks into Google lesbian adult image gallery. <laughs> Opposite a Google unhurriedly trades the sex stopping come to an in flight perfect example article Google removes Scientology. Stick your heads in pigs. Google removes DMCA offenders by US Marine. I'm impressed. By Cowie the fan. Don't blame Google. It's the fucking DMCA again. <laughs> Google's swift removal of anti-Scientology sites is only a tip of the iceberg. Search engines cannot test, test, test. Anyway, just as I was about to write some brilliant fucking retort to the whole Google bombing fiasco, Ben goes off and writes, some lost Canadians in a dark, dark place. Canada sucks. 
I hate Canada. <laughs> Fucking Canada. Fourth most relevant on Yahoo and Google. Cached similar pages. <laughs> And yeah, as I said, I didn't really, I didn't write that. <laughs> um, and here's, a, here's another kind of uh, internet kind of um, themed poem called Code Pervin. Um, so you know what perving is? <laughs> you must know. Explain perving. it to me. Perving is like, you know, if... if <laughs> anyway, I'll, um, I'll just read it out, maybe you'll get an idea of what it means. So it's about, um, yeah, it's about HTML. Hot. Rocked up to the address, entered the site, I popped the hood and just started perving on your code. It's clean and oh so elegantly compliant, tags in a row, only you and I see this bit. Just as well my employers put a block on search strings and downloads. Code's much less demanding and full of secret holes. We place our Java there. Pop-up desire passed through a notepad space. Control, I spotted neater hacks where fools did previously bumble graffiti hose. And look forward to hearing this browser's virtual hum dwindling like dial-up. I know accessibility is an ever disappointing hurdle. Still, I'll jump. Your orphan session has been killed. Code Pervin on down the long dawn fanfare. Hardly. I've seen the source. Clock in your curves. HTML, of course. <laughs> and I'll just read one more. And it's actually also internet themed. <laughs> They're all about the internet. And this is called Let, Let's Fight the Pop Ups. I don't know if you know what a pop up is. I'm hoping you do. <laughs> Anyone who doesn't know what it is, please put up their hand. Let's fight the pop-ups. <laughs> Meddling kids with the internet pop-ups. Planning jitches in those unexpected drum filmer crevice moments. Inevitable dooms, I fall between the terminals of thunder and the beginnings of the jaundiced plague. It's down on hands and hips and back to feeling aghast. My baby lives on pop-up pages. I shudder, though my slacks stained with mustard do tell sadder tales. And if possible, avoid computers entirely made of mould. Don't mention mousetraps in this house. A typewriter's warm key tapped a la morse plastique. I don't know French, but I love what you're doing with that, Jim. And please consider joining me for a snack, yes, or a mid-morning TV advertisement. You know, at least they don't pop up like some brat on AML. Well, I could go on. But I don't want to mention the names, now that my password has been hijacked by a kid with two brains. <laughs> and so now we move on to the third and final book that I'll be talking about today. And actually, this is a funny book because it doesn't exist. Um, except as a JPEG. In July 2009, as my PhD thesis was in its final stages of production, I discovered that another chapbook of mine had been archived by the National Library of Australia. As it turns out, this was one of the only copies of Dead Poem Office that was ever printed and was probably bought at the National Young Writers Festival at the Zine and Book Fair. Um, how it ended up in the National Library's archives, I'm not actually sure. The person I sold it to might have been an undercover collector, snapping up copies of zines and chapbooks for a special purpose. And whatever reason, the book has now been catalogued, uh, is available for reading by the general public, and is now even available for digital download for a price. And actually, because I don't have any copies of the book, I had to pay $13.50 for them to send me a scanned copy, which I had to print out today to show to you. And this is, if you compare those two images, they're not even the same book. I mean, I don't know why that, ah, okay, right. It should have been like turned on its side, you know, so it's like, dip. but as you'll notice in the scan, I hope you can see this, but my name has been erased. You cannot see my name anymore. 
Um, probably because it was um, printed in silver to start with. It's not a very good idea. Um, so for me, this, this, um, this book being available uh, long after my death and maybe read by two or three people um, stands in, in sharp contrast to this book, which of course also has been archived by the National Library, but may not be so interesting to people in the future as this strange book. Um, maybe someone <laughs> one day will write like a, a thesis about this book and what it means and like they couldn't find any more copies of it anymore and how rare is it you know um, in the same way that Patrick White's book which he tried his whole life to uh, to destroy is more interesting to me than any of the novels he ever wrote precisely because it's so rare and so strange um, yeah so um, I, I'm sort of getting to the, to the, to, towards the end of my presentation now. Um, I could read you a couple of poems from this book that you'll never read. Do you want me to? Okay. Um, okay. Um, this is a very small print, but um, anyway, this is this is an exclusive. This is a world first. You know, the first <laughs> people who've ever heard this poem. Well, actually, not. And this poem is called The Boy's Who. The boy who wanted to be a film director. The boy who vomited at his 10th birthday party. The boy who smiled at dead rainbows. The boy who cried. The boy whose mother wouldn't kiss him goodnight. The boy who wouldn't grow up. The boy who disappeared. The boy who got shot at. The boy who never left. The boy who said the boy who looks after all his sisters is a girl. The boy who had no sisters. The boy who kissed his best friend's sister. The boy who missed out on kisses. The boy who runs. The boy who drew spirals on his wrist. The boys who swam across the river. The boy who followed them never made it back. The boy who traveled there. The boy who dreams. The boy who was a girl. The boy who bellows. The boy who found God. The boy who suddenly thought he was God. The boy who drew pictures of God that looked like nuts. The boy who was a nut. The boy who invented peanut butter. The boy who ate crocodiles. The boy who lied in his sleep. The boy who'd sell his own aunt for a peanut. The boy who understood French movies. The boy who thought he was a French movie and later turned out to be right. The boy who tried to fly to the moon in a French movie. The boy who he met when he got there. The boy who met boys out the front of the movies offering peanuts. The boy who'd seen it all was mistaken because he hadn't yet seen the boy who sees boys who say they've seen it all. The boy who insisted on wearing white shoes. The boy who liked to steal white shoes. The boy whose shoes were once white. The boy who tried to eat peanuts but didn't know he was allergic to peanuts. The boy who offered them to him was very sorry. The boy who died never knew he was sorry. The boy who did it never did it again. And the boy who wanted to be the film director never grew up to find out who did become the boy who wants to be the boy who after all. <laughs> okay, so I'm, uh, I'm getting, getting to my conclusion now, which is great for you guys. Oh yeah, so that, yeah, this is the the cover image of that. And what do you notice up the top there? Good old Dewey Decimal number. Do you guys even know what that is? <laughs> Probably not. You don't need to know that stuff anymore. But um, the the significant bit there is A821.4, which is the Dewey Decimal number for Australian poetry. So my book is sort of forever archived as uh, as a part of the Australian poetry. And this is the, yeah, this is just the, I don't know what that is. <laughs> All right, you only, you only got one. Okay, are we there yet? Uh, no. Um, I guess to sum up, I'd like to say that self-published chapbooks are indeed actors within a field of books whose only real enemy is that bonfire of the vanity presses that all writers fear. For this reason alone, self-published books, I believe, should be celebrated, discussed, and remembered. 
Um, while many forms of publishing and dissemination are possible, when poets use traditional formats like the chapbook, they're in fact entering into conversations with older fields of prestige and value. And looking again at the fields in which poetry books uh, are produced involves an analysis of the role of books as signifiers of prestige and, and value. Um, and that's, you know, kind of a little bit too theoretical even for me. And despite technological changes in the way poets communicate their works to the world, older book forms, like the chapbook, still play a significant role in poetry publishing. And one thing I haven't talked about is the fact that on my website I've, I've posted hundreds of poems, but none of them are really as valuable as this little book was to, is to me. And why do you think that might be? I don't want you to answer that right now. Um, I wouldn't want to suggest that poets remain fixed in a Gutenberg galaxy, but despite the growing use of information and communications technologies by poets, for example in the growing number of poets with blogs or the proliferation of poetry mailing lists, poetry is an area of the literary arts where the individual book remains very important. Significant changes have occurred in the field of online poetry publishing and see, I am actually going to talk about my magazine. Um, in, in, in the last decade, I think, um, distribution and broadcast models for poetry using ICTs, including the internet, for example, by hijacking Blogger to create a poetry journal, um, emerging post-avant poetry communities, there are such a thing, post-avant, post-avant-garde, it's, you yeah. Um, the proliferation of mailing lists, the increased use of print-on-demand technologies and avenues for online payments and distribution, they're of course being explored. Um, on the other hand, uh, this kind of publishing I think is a different kind of performance to the publishing of a self-published self poetry chapbook. Um, and I think that the internet offers uh, kind of interesting possibilities for self-authorization. And imagine what Walt Whitman could have done with the internet if he was alive today. He would have been all over the internet. He would have had like 20 different blogs. He would have been like sending his poems to all sorts of places. He would have been getting, paying people to write good things on their blog about him and link to him. Um, and that's essentially how he became famous again. And I'm not bitter, and I don't want to be, you know, as famous as Walt Whitman. Um, so, and th this, this is, and, and I, will, I will end here, this kind of leads me to the question of, in an internet age, as opposed to a print age, where universities and, and academics and, and so on used to be able to say, these are the famous books, these are the great poets, um, when that's not possible anymore, when everybody can be a poet, everyone can distribute their own works, how do we assess who is good and who is bad? Do we still need to do that anymore? Does it really matter? I don't care if people think I'm good or bad, but what about these hundreds of thousands of people who are writing their stuff online and want to be kind of regarded as, as, as a good writer? Who is going to make that judgment? So I guess I, I leave you with that question and I'd be very interested in your answers to that question as, as people who I'm assuming are actually quite familiar with um, internet technologies and who do read hopefully <laughs> some things online, if not read online then perhaps you know um, listen to music online or, or um, films and so on. Um, does, do you think it matters anymore? Do we, do we, do we, uh, are we beyond the idea of greatness in, uh, in the arts? And if so, where does that leave us all? Um, and, you know, if, if, if there is really, uh, if, if things really have changed so much, why do we still read books? So I'll leave it there. Thank you for listening. Oh, yeah. And... I just want to say that Imperio is about to leave, <laughs> the first of many. Um, I can't help myself, I've made a little chapbook while, I, while I've been here in Sweden. I have ten copies to give away and you know it's the greatest chapbook ever written. So you know the ten copies are right here up the front, 
you don't need to even talk to me, you know, you can just walk past the desk and take the book and walk out. It's okay. Okay, so, oh yeah, we, well, this is the last word. And anyway, this is my website, and I, I, I send out a, a poem newsletter every week. So if you want to si sign up for it, I'll leave that up there and you can, you can sign up. So, yeah, thanks once again for putting up with me. I know I'm a bit of a crazy, weird-ass poet, but um, I hope you got something out of it, and I'd be really interested in, in your comments. <laughs> We, we do have time for, for questions and comments, and I hope that some of you will have some. It's interesting how you said that having your own review on your own site. In my world, that is almost a must. I mean, uh, you, using YouTube, Twitter, uh, all these, you, you, you cross-promote yourself all the time. So, yeah, that was just a little comment. That, for, for me, that would be totally normal. Yeah. Right. As long as it's someone else actually doing the review. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's right. But that's, that's interesting. Well, actually, maybe not. You'd be happy to do a review of yourself? Yes. But I use a different... I think I'm great. <laughs> <laughs> and that's it. Why would you say you're great? That sucks. Yeah. Objective. Yeah. That's hard to be objective when you're talking about yourself, isn't it? I am so mature. I am very funny. Yeah. I don't know. What do, you, what do you think? Do you think that was a bad move for me to publish that review on my own website? Well, where else would you have published it? Well, I wouldn't have published it. I mean, that would have. The person who wrote the review might have just submitted it somewhere else. Yeah. But do you know if this person knew that you were the editor? Yeah, of course. Yeah. But the great thing is we don't accept comments on reviews on our website, so, you know, people <laughs> say, I am the Lord, you know. I can do whatever I want. But I think it's an interesting question, you know. The, 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 the possibility to, to deceive, you know, to, to sort of present this thing that looks convincingly, as you say, objective, you know. I don't know. This was done in 2007. Yeah. Mm. Why is that? I mean, now 2011, it is, it's very different from 2007. I think, I think it has less to do with the difference between 2007 and 2011 than it has to do that with the fact that you're dealing with the publishing domain mm. and literature, and and uh, in that in that regard, then it does you know at some level it traditionally would look kind of dodgy yeah. you know, to have a review of your own book when you're the editor of the journal. But I mean in that way it's a, it's a provoc it's provocative mm. that it's there. You know, so that, I mean that people are if literary types are put off by it, then that's an issue that I mean needs to be dealt with at a, at a larger level based on the internet practices, which would include what Martin's saying. Yeah. I guess the other thing I didn't mention was that one of the other reviews that was on the radio, it was written by one of my best friends, you know, and in her review she didn't say, I know this guy really well and we've been out, you know, drinking and we've done all this other stuff, you know, it was like, no, no, this is a very, you know, interesting book by, a, by, a, by an emerging author, you know what I mean, like that, that, that's also a kind of deception, don't you think, I don't know. Or is the world so small that, that that's the literary world so small? Yeah. It's just part of that's part of the genre anyway. I mean, what you're saying that's not unique to you. I mean, no. the whole, I mean, the, the sort of inbred PR publishing and self-publishing and promotion. Yeah. I mean, it's just that it's more. <laughs> it, it is underground, mm. and you may not see it in the same way. But I'd be interested for you to answer sort of your own question about why you said that, that particular book was sort of more important to you or most important, or whatever you said about this book. What, what is it? Because I can feel your attachment to the materiality. Yeah. This. So what is it about that? that yeah, well, it's just that, it's that I made it myself. I mean, of course, I had to steal the paper and the printer, you know. It's a bit dodgy to do that. Maybe it was the kind of thrill of that, you know, like, oh, we're in this member of parliament's offices and we're going <laughs> to... Give them press, you know, but is it, 200 is it copies. The first time you did that, as compared yeah. to like the chapbook that you did here, that was your first opportunity to make 
your own book? That, the, the, the Happy Farang? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was the first one I made. Yeah, and of course anyone can do that stuff at any time, but I think it's, it's what I was trying to get at before, that it's a kind of an individual, personal thing, and then therefore you don't want everyone in the world to read it. You want to give it to your friends and family as a gift, and you know what I mean? Like, it's sort of special like that. I don't know, yeah. I mean, do you think that's more private? Private publishing, that yeah, I mean, I would if if I had more time, I would have got into the whole private publishing um, uh, area. I think it it is more uh, more like that, and and actually, like the, a lot of the private presses, it's all about the quality of the paper and printing it on an old, you know, old printing presses with typography and stuff that we don't need to worry about anymore because we have word processing. But yeah, that's what I that's what I like like about it. It is kind of private. Yeah. Until I tell 50 people about it, you know, then it's not actually private anymore. Yeah. But you also asked the question about <coughs> sort of value judgments and good and bad. And, and I mean, this is what everybody always says about the internet, right? That any, you know, anyone can become, you know, a publisher. Anyone can become a musician. Anyone, yeah. can, you know, that it enables all of this together. And I just wonder from the perspective of you know, a poet and someone who identifies as a poet and someone who is an editor of a poetry journal, what about the questions of, you know, quality? How, how to, I mean, to what degree do you consider that or think about that or are there poets that you know in terms of, is there still this sort of sense to feel that you have to differentiate, you know, that somehow quality is preserved and how is quality preserved when anyone can have a blog and anyone can have a, a poetry, you know, journal? Yeah. I don't know. Well, I have to say, when I look at blogs, you know, if, if it's like some cookie cutter template that everyone's got, you know, the kind of basic blogger template or the basic WordPress template, or I just can't read it because it's so, they have, the, the writer hasn't put any effort into their design. Their blog looks like 50,000 other blogs that are the same, and why would I bother reading that content? So for me, it's about the style and about the presentation. Like, the, you know, I, you can judge for yourself, but I like the I like the sort of the the fact that this is a colourful cover and it's sort of been handmade, and it's not like um, the sort of books that you can get generically made on, on Lulu or something, you know, like as that are kind of got that have got no style and haven't been designed at all. So I think for me, it's about the way you present. It is about the sort of way you present yourself. But is that not just packaging? I mean, can you still have crap? You have a beautifully designed site, but it doesn't have any content. So yeah, is well. That the but maybe I'm just more interested in the design of the site. <laughs> oh, that's a nice font. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. But I don't know how other people, you know, I don't, I'm actually, I, I, I'm wondering how many people actually do read stuff online. Do you read anything on blogs that's not, you know, sort of blog entries? <laughs> Do you mean like creative work? Yeah, creative. Do people do people in this class in this room? You know, do you, do you read stuff online? Yes. Yeah. Yeah? yeah. What sort of what sort of things do you read? Poets. Yeah. Okay. That's great. Some reviews. Yeah. Okay. Wow. <laughs> I'm amazed. <laughs> so it's not true that no one reads this stuff. Yeah. That's interesting. Hmm. Yeah. Any other comments? Yeah. Hi. Have you ever um, participated on poetry slams uh, in public? Yeah. 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 That's fun. Yeah. Have you done that also? Uh, well, <laughs> I've, I've been on a few, but I never like was the. Uh, I wasn't that, that confident to really do it. Right, okay. Yeah. It's fine, that's true. Do you, do you think that you prefer to listen to poetry that's read aloud than to read it? Or? I think it's, it's always interesting to see the people's reaction better than just like online when you have your own reaction and just see the comments. It's always nice to really see the mood and the people, yeah. like when they scream or when they laugh or when they're just silent and no one says anything. It's, it's always yeah. <laughs> get that feeling and yeah I usually get the silence when I read <laughs> you know it's like 
Next. <laughs> what? Like, admi admiration or really uh, like shock? Or yeah, it could be respect, couldn't it? Like, whoa, <laughs> I don't dare even breathe. It's so good. <laughs> what do you think of the kind of competitive aspect of, of the slams? Do you think that's a good thing? You know, if people's work is, say, judged out of five by an, out, out of, by an audience member, is that, is that a good? I would say so. I think it gives you the, 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 say the kick or want to do it then you you more like really want to win over others it's oh, i think that's such, such a nat natural human thing <laughs> but i think it's true that it would i mean i've seen people who um who uh, who participated first and they weren't really good and then next time you can see in a like a development so mm -hmm, it's mm -hmm. always interesting to see that yeah yeah no, I, 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 yeah, I, I do enjoy going to slams. I, I find sometimes that though that if if you're on with really really good people, you know, and if you're still like uh, reading from a page and they're like doing it without any prompts or whatever, and they're like, you know, you're really getting into it. Like I just feel like a total nerd, you know. Like <laughs> here's one of my poems in this book, you know. Um, but yeah, I think it's a really that's and and the great thing about the the good slammers and the good performances is that a lot of them are filmed and you can watch them, you know, on YouTube and and, and in other places as well. And this, yeah, it's kind of a more sort of real moment or experience for people. I think, yeah, yeah. I would say the big the big problem with slams is like the it's hard to be so it's really really hard. Yeah, I mean, I'm a slam veteran. <laughs> of sorts. Respect. And, 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 uh, <laughs> That's always been my problem, that uh, there is this sort of, I mean, because you put emphasis on the performance, uh, a sort of style emerges. And I haven't been to international slams. I've only been to Swedish slams. But there's definitely like a poetry voice yeah. you know, that people use if they haven't found one of their own. Um, and, and I mean, I, I think that's a shame because you you kind of overlook or you miss a lot of great stuff because it's um, it's it doesn't hit you you know because uh, Islam is like it's very immediate you have three minutes to read your text and then you maybe you don't get another chance so you have to like scream and shout and yeah <laughs> do all this stuff or or I mean you can be subtle but it's really really hard. Yeah, I, I I know exactly what you mean. It sort of becomes a cross between stand-up comedy and shouty shouty kind of poetry, and yeah. Or versions of other famous poets. Yeah. <laughs> like <laughs> how many Saul Williams poems can you find on slimes? Yeah, or the Ginsberg style yeah. poets or whatever. Yeah, interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Another one bites the dust. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, hi. Uh, I, I just want to ask, like, um, uh, everyone, uh, when you write a poem, uh, like, uh, you, you feel good if, like, people appreciate you. Yeah. But is it always, like, uh, the appreciation from others that motivates to write you, or is it just, like, your form of expression for writing poem? Like, why did you choose poem? Other yeah, okay. That's a good question. Thank you. Um, yeah, of course I want I want to get the feedback from people. You know, I want I want to know that I've sort of put something in someone's brain. As uh, it sounds quite horrible, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> but like I, w I want to be able to sort of think that by reading a poem out for you today, okay, maybe maybe you didn't like it, you know, maybe Maybe you just weren't listening or whatever, it doesn't matter. But like maybe for some of you, it was like for one instant, oh yeah, you know, it made you think about something else. Um, and I like that kind of response. But I think uh, uh, to answer your question properly, yeah, of course you, you do it for your own self-expression in the way that other people may paint or make music or, you know, make YouTube videos or, uh, you know, for me it is a, it's a very personal, personal thing as well. And I have written many poems that no one has ever seen as well that no one will ever see I hope until I die and then you know they open up my computer and there's like thousands of poems on there 
you know, and they go, wow, this guy was great. <laughs> <laughs> Pity he didn't, you know, do anything useful with his talent when he was alive. <laughs> but then in that sense, what does it matter, you know, if you're famous or not? You know, it's, I'm, not, I'm not famous and I, I still write poems, you know, a lot of the time, yeah. But have you considered writing, like, novels or...? Yeah, I try to, but I, can't, I cannot, I can't stay interested for very long. Like, a poem's great, you know, five minutes, bam. <laughs> I'm done. I'm out of here. <laughs> On to the next one. Yeah, you know, it's sort of short. It's like an advertisement, you know, a TV ad. Yeah. Maybe that's just my generation, TV ads and, yeah. No, but, yeah. I write the flash poems. Right. <laughs> Awesome. That's how I think. It's a new genre here. It's so hot right now. Yeah. Totally <laughs> 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 Excellent. But do you, do you, to any extent, are you engaged? Are you sort of actively engaged in sort of trying to promote your work through other books? You know, you, you seem to have some, very conscious of the difference between your 2007 book and your own self published book. So is that at all a sort of quest of yours or would it be meaningful to you to have, you know, another, you know, I don't know what you were calling, normal publication or proper. You know, a proper publication? I mean, is that something that you still, you know, find a value in? or? Is um, it actually, no. I mean, or? no, because frankly, I mean, this book, 500 copies printed, you know, it's been on sale for like four years now. I've not received one cent for this book. I've actually had to buy a hundred copies of it to give away to people. So I spent like a thousand bucks, you know, to have this book, which everyone goes, oh wow, it's so professional, you're a real proper poet now, you know. But that's what, I fr what frustrates me, is that I think if I do another book, I'll pay for it myself to start with and screw them, you know. Because it's not just the publisher who takes the money, it's the bookshop, it's the distributor, it's the postal person. You know, there's so many people along that chain of, you know, the, the feeding chain before it gets to the author. My royalties amounted to, if, if I got them, be like 2.5%. And 2.5% of nothing, you know. So it's, it's, you know, in a way, it's not, it's not about, it, as I said uh, before, it's not about the money for me at all. It's actually that, that these sort of books have some sort of symbolic value that, that other books, uh, that other things don't have in my life. Um, and maybe, maybe uh, people who are readers have a different idea. Maybe you just think, oh, that's something that it, you just stapled together. It's true. But, you know, for me it has a, a kind of different kind of value, but... In the end, that's up to the people who read it. So, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I was just wondering about. You still said that that book, the the properly published one, opened sort of doors for you to talk about the other stuff. I mean, I was thinking about that because there's this, um, like in Sweden, there's this writers' association, Fifatafabunda, and you're only allowed to like be a member if you've published or been published two times, I think. Right. Uh, and I mean, for for one thing, like uh, I, I have no idea what their policy on digital poetry or literature is. They probably don't have a policy, <laughs> um, but mostly it's about like what fees you can, what, how much you can charge if you go somewhere and, and give a rating or, or yeah, exactly. Um, so I mean. What do you think about that? Yeah, it sucks, doesn't it? Do you, yeah. I mean, I, I won't. I won't tell you how much I'm being paid to be here today. <laughs> um, and BTH doesn't even know that yet. <laughs> um, no, but I think it's a, it's a weird sort of barrier to entry, isn't it? You know, and and it's it's the same. Like, um, I got a grant from the Australia Council. I was very lucky to do so after trying for ten years to get one. But the, you know, in order to even be eligible, you have to have twenty poems published in proper journals, yeah? And, and if you've self-published your own books, you have to have printed 500 copies and it has to be reviewed in a national newspaper. And there's only one national newspaper in Australia and it's owned by Rupert Murdoch, you know? He doesn't review self-published books. Well, they don't. I mean, I, I know he's not 
<laughs> the dude reading the books, you know, or the, uh, doing the reviews. But yeah, it's a barrier to entry and it just creates this sort of exclusive thing like, oh wow, the proper poets and yeah, I, I hate it. Yeah. I'm sure you do too. You hate it? Yeah, sort of. I mean, I hate is a All right. strong word. Yeah, dislike. Yeah. <laughs> Unlike. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah. Okay, any other questions? Requests? <laughs> One more poem. No. Yeah. No. No. <laughs> no, no, no. 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 <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, well, thank you very much.